YouTube land, biology students, etc., etc., etc. This is Ms. Scott with a video that I promised several months ago, but I'm now making today on how to solve pedigrees. All right, so I've made a video and have lectured in class about how to read a pedigree, what these little shapes mean, what it means to be a filled in shape versus a not filled in shape or a half shaded shape or whatever. So now we're going to use those. Okay, that's all fine and dandy if you can read it. Now do something useful with it. We're going to solve it. Remember, one of the reasons we use pedigrees is to figure out how traits are inherited. Not everything is necessarily dominant, like simple dominant recessive. You're not sure if it's dominant or recessive. We want to find out is it autosomal or sex link. And pedigrees help us do that. All right, so let's start with answering those two questions I just mentioned. We can use a pedigree to determine if a trait is autosomal or sex linked. What autosomal means is that the trait is carried on one of the first 22, one of the first 22 chromosomes. Sex linked are genes or traits that are carried on the 23rd pair, the sex pair. And for our purposes, we're only going to be looking at X linked traits because everybody has at least one X chromosome. All right. So how do we figure out? Is it autosomal or is it recessive? We have a picture up here. That's what we're going to use first. If it's autosomal, if it's autosomal, there is a tendency you will have males and females affected equally or close to it. And this is a pedigree that only shows four generations. Um, and you would want to have more people to make a definite conclusion. But for here, we have two people that have the traits, one male and one female. So we can determine this is probably autosomal. If it were sex linked, and again, we're talking about the X linked trait. It's not, I mean, even the Y linked traits, yeah, by default. For sex linked traits, you will have more males affected. But because we have one of each here, we're going to assume it's autosomal. All right, now we want to say is it dominant or recessive. And you figure that out by looking at how often does it appear between all the generations. If it is recessive, which many disorders are, like cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia, it is possible for that trait to skip a generation. So if we look here at this pedigree, mom and dad did not have the trait. They were otherwise normal individuals. They had three kids, two are normal, one was affected. What that means is that both these parents have the allele for it, but they didn't show it, making it recessive. This person married this individual. They had four kids, none of which were affected. One of their children gets married and has a child that is. So the skipping generations tells us that this is a recessive trait. Dominant traits it's not possible for a dominant trait to skip generations. And I'll show you what that looks like here with another example in a moment. All right. The other reason there are the other, another practical use of a pedigree that you might see in a problem coming up soon, say next week during, you know, a quiz or a test or whatever, is that I could give you a pedigree and I could ask, hey, what are the genotypes of these people? And then use those genotypes to make a Punnett square. You got to be able to work backwards, know what you have here, and then expand on that. All right. So to figure out the genotypes, you have to figure out if it's recessive or dominant first. We found out that it's recessive. It's autosomal, so we're going to use those, those particular rules. The only genotypes, remember for, let me back up, remember for recessive traits, like, like cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia and all that, all that stuff. In order to show that, you have to have two recessive traits, which mean, or two recessive alleles, which means you have to have the genotype little lowercase allele, lowercase allele. All right, so here are genotypes. We know this person has to be, and I'm going to use the letter 
Let's use the letter A for a, let's just say this is sickle cell. That's what this person has to be. Same with this individual here. All right, that was easy enough. Well, these alleles had to come from somewhere. They must have come from the parents of this particular offspring. So I go back. That means both these parents have at least one recessive allele. All right, that's halfway done. Well, they don't show the trait, but they carry the recessive allele. That means they must have a dominant one that hides it. So I can fill that in as well. And now I have that little family genotypes. Um, for all these other non-affected individuals, again, we know they have at least one dominant. That's why they show that particular trait. Okay. And the remainder, the only one, hmm, let's see. No, you could, you could do the other ones. For this individual, you use the same rules as you did here. This individual, both their parents had a recessive allele, so we can fill that in. So two heterozygous parents. This one, for these, the remaining children here, because this parent has both recessive alleles, that's the only thing they're going to be able to donate to their children, so I can fill those in as well. So now I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine out of 12, or no, yeah, nine out of 12 individuals, I know their genotypes. For these individuals, if we make a Punnett square of this original set of parents here, which we can do really, really fast, we see that they could be either homozygous dominant or heterozygous. There's no telling here how many or which genotype they have unless they have other offspring that either show show the trait or not. That's the only way you could get a definite a definite genotype for that. Let's take a look now at another kind of pedigree with another type of inheritance and see if we can determine the genotypes of the individuals on it. Alright, so our next kind looks a little bit different than the kind we just had. I say no, it's just circles and squares, you're right, but look at which circles and squares are filled in, which ones aren't. Is it autosomal or sex link? Let's ask that first. We have a number of individuals here. We have only three that are affected, and all three of those are our squares, which means they're male. Whenever you have more males being disproportionately affected over females, you probably are dealing with a sex link trait on the X chromosome, so this is sex linked. Something like hemophilia or colorblindness. Is it recessive or dominant? Again, look at where, where the um, affected individuals are. Trace them back to their parents. If at any point you see you have an affected individual who has two normal phenotype parents, it's a recessive trait. So this individual, both his parents appear normal. They are not showing the trait. Same with this individual, not showing the trait, two parents not showing the trait, having a child that does, and another one here. So this is a sex-linked recessive disorder, like hemophilia. Let's call it hemophilia for this example. All right, we want to determine, again, the big, something that is useful about these. I could ask you, I could give you this picture and make a bunch of questions that would involve you making a Punnett square. So you got to be able to tell what the genotypes are. All right. With these, I like, because I figured out that it's dominant and it's sex linked, I'm going to go and make the genotype of the affected individuals first. That's the easiest thing to see. Okay, so I go here. Because it's sex linked, I know I have to put the XY. And you can't see that. You have to put the X. X's and Y's showing the sex chromosomes because it matters if you're male or female. He is affected because it's recessive. We're going to put a little H with this X. No, we're not going to put anything with the Y because the Y doesn't carry this particular allele. So that would make this person affected. 
this person has the exact same phenotype, or genotype, excuse me, as well as this individual here. X little HY, X little HY. Okay? When you're looking at the sex-linked traits, if you figure out that a pedigree is sex-linked, you can figure out where, where did this allele start? Was it with mom or dad? When you have males that are affected, males inherit these disorders from their mothers 100% of the time. And the reason why is, in order to be male, they must have inherited a Y chromosome. Well, where does a Y chromosome come from? It comes from dad. Dad, in this case, is not affected, so he is X big age. Why? Which means mom, she's not affected either, which means she's also X big age. The other X that she has that makes her female must also be carrying this recessive allele. So she donated this allele to this son. Okay? The exact same thing applies to this set of parents as well as this set of parents. This woman must have been a carrier. She donated one of the recessive alleles to her son. This male, because he does not express the trait, has only one dominant allele. We can't tell necessarily what these children are, their genotypes. We know they have at least one, they must have at least one dominant allele, because that's the only dominant allele dad can donate to a daughter. But we're not sure what mom donated. And you wouldn't be able to tell until these children had offspring of their own to see, does that recessive, did that recessive trait get passed along to their sons? Okay? When you have a male, excuse me, when you have a male who is affected, he will automatically pass one of these recessive alleles along to his daughters. Because remember, females are always X, X. One X comes from dad. This is the only X that's there. And it's got a little recessive allele on it. So we can fill that in. Because they're not affected, they're not affected. They have one dominant allele that came from mom. And we can see that she... Because she's not affected either, she must also carry the dominant allele. What this one is, we're not sure. We'd have to look at her family pedigree and see if there's any traces of hemophilia there. Now this pedigree, I made it a little trickier for you because I did not denote carriers. Another easy way to tell genotypes, if you have... No, I'll use the red marker. If you have any genotype or any pedigrees, that have the half filled in shapes, that is showing you wh where the carriers are. And this also helps you here's a carrier. This also helps you determine, this is another way to determine really easily if it's sex linked or autosomal. The sex link traits, remember, only females are carriers. It's impossible to be a male carrier for the sex-linked traits, and males are much more likely to be affected. All right. So I will leave it there. If you have any questions about how to read pedigrees or how to solve problems from a pedigree, please feel free to reach out and comment or ask me in class or whatever. I don't care. Send a carrier pigeon. That's cool, too. And I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And if you have any more suggestions for other topics you'd like me to cover, please let me know in the comments below, and I will... Try to accommodate this for you. Have a steeper bueno day, y'all.